Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Soul of Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, conceal me. Do not permit me to be parted from you. From the evil foe, protect me. At the hour of my death, call me. And bid me come to you to praise you with all your saints forever and ever. Amen. Well, this evening's talk is basically centered on the Eucharist and, let's say, those other aspects of our Catholic faith that are very much connected with the Eucharist, and that, of course, is the Holy Mass and the priesthood. So I'd like to just start with a gospel passage from St. John. Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. The Gospel of the Lord. As we know from uh, St. John's Gospel, we have that whole beautiful chapter on uh, the Eucharist and the true nature of the Eucharist. Sometimes, well, not sometimes, we have 2,000 years of quarreling amongst Christians, which is why we have many other Christian groups as well. It's usually centered on uh, the true nature of the Eucharist. So I'd like to sort of speak a lot about the, well, no, no, to speak on the Eucharist tonight, and especially those things that surround the Eucharist. Back in 2007, Pope Benedict XVI, who was gloriously reigning at the time, gave us a very beautiful document on the Eucharist. I mean, all popes have, thankfully. I think every single Supreme Pontiff over the years, over the centuries, have written on the Eucharist. But what I like about Pope Benedict XVI's um, apostolic letter, which is called Sacramentum Caritatis, on the sacrament of love, what I like about it is because Pope Benedict, being German, uh, is very clear and concise, and, you know, it's, it's, it's just black and white. So it's very easy to read and very easy to understand. And uh, that's why I often go back to Pope Benedict's writings when it comes to the faith, because uh, as much as I loved Pope John Paul II, and I grew up with Pope John Paul II, the, the great, um, Pope St. John Paul II was a philosopher. And so if any, any of you try to read his encyclicals or his writings, you know that you sort of would read a paragraph and then think, what did I just read? And then go back again and hang on a second, let me go back again, which is great. But Pope Benedict in his writings, of course, you sort of read and went, well, that makes perfect sense. And um, as it does with this beautiful document in 2007. And he reminded us in this document back in 2007 that the Eucharist was a mystery to be believed, a mystery to be celebrated, and a mystery to be lived. And that's how exactly how I like to sort of formulate my discussion. As we hear in the good book, there is nothing new under the sun. Why should I reinvent the will when it comes to the Eucharist, when I think the single greatest mind of the last century, Pope Benedict XVI, has already given us food for thought when it comes to the most holy Eucharist. So when we think of the Eucharist as a mystery to be believed, well, what do we believe? Yes, we can easily say in a catechism sort of way, yes, it is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. It is the real presence of Christ. But then that, that would be the end of my talk, and I've got a, a few more things to say. So we want to sort of stretch that out a little bit. What's our understanding of the Eucharist? 
Our understanding of the Eucharist is this, of course, that what we celebrate is what we believe. There's a Latin adage, a Latin saying, lex orandi, lex credendi. And I'm not just throwing these Latin terms at you willy-nilly, they actually have very important meaning. Lex orandi, lex credendi means, what does it mean? It means the law or the way we pray is or reflects what we believe. So our worship and our faith have to be, to use a modern term, in sync. They have to synchronize each other. They have to mean something. And every single year, we have, of course, the beautiful celebration of the Easter Tridium. And of course, that celebration of the Easter Tridium is the culmination, the, the summit of our liturgical year, but the summit of our celebration. It's very interesting how that whole Tridium is formulated, liturgically speaking. We begin on Holy Thursday. The priest comes in, of course, with all the servers and the incense. It's all very beautiful. And he begins Mass in a normal way. But think about the end of the Holy Thursday liturgy. Father does not say, go in peace to love and serve the Lord, etc., etc. No. In fact, at the end of Mass, we have that beautiful Eucharistic procession as we go to the Garden of Gethsemane and stay with the Lord. Mass actually hasn't finished. And it hasn't finished because it actually continues into Good Friday. The Good Friday liturgy, for those of you who remember, I'm sure you do, was only a few weeks ago. We don't come in with a beautiful hymn. Father comes in very silently, prostrates himself before the altar, then goes to the chair and begins just with the prayer. There's no, the Lord be with you, the grace of our Lord. There's none of that. Because we're not beginning Mass. We are continuing a liturgical action that actually began the night before. At the end of Good Friday, there's no recessional hymn. There's no go forth, the Mass is ended, thanks be to God. No. In fact, we leave in silence after venerating the, the Holy Cross. And come to the Easter Vigil. It's dark, there's a fire pit, the church is dark, we light candles, we have a beautiful hymn of the exalted, we read the readings in semi-darkness, all of a sudden a glorious song, light, the candles are lit, lights go on, the bells are rung, it's on for young and old. And at the end of that liturgy, finally Father says, go in peace, alleluia, alleluia, thanks be to God, alleluia, alleluia. We finally finished, at the end of the Easter Vigil, the liturgy that we began at the beginning of Holy Thursday. Because it's one action, one faith. Lex orandi, lex credendi. We worship as we believe. Because what happens in those three days is one action, the Paschal mystery. When we refer to the Paschal mystery, that is what we are referring to. The Last Supper, the great sacrifice of Christ at Calvary, and His glorious resurrection on the third day. And that whole action, of course, is how we get our understanding of the Eucharist. Because to use Catholic language, as we read in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, yes, there are several aspects of the Eucharist. The most important aspect of the Eucharist is it is the sacrifice of Calvary, which is why I'm spending tomorrow evening just speaking on the cross, because Calvary is very important. Sometimes, as I'll repeat this tomorrow again, we live a Catholic Christian existence of always hopping to Easter. Everything's about the resurrection. And we are, a, to quote St. Augustine, it's not quoting Pope St. John Paul II, that's quite erroneous. You'll see that in a lot of the memes on social media. And it's actually St. Augustine, he was quoting. We are an Easter people, and Alleluia is our song. Yes, we are an Easter people, but we are an Easter people because of the cross on Good Friday. My mother, who's uh, Italian, will always say to me when something's going bad, ah... There's no Easter Sunday without Good Friday. And I said, thanks, Mum. Yeah, thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the reminder. <laughs> yeah, I'm you know, 50 years old, been a, a Francisco Friar 25 years, but I go home, I'm still Mummy's little boy. What can you do? 
But the th thing is, this is how we celebrate, but this is what we believe. And the Eucharist is that moment from the Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and the Easter Vigil. In fact, every single celebration of Holy Mass, it doesn't matter if it's Sunday, it doesn't matter if it's a weekday, it doesn't matter what day of the week it is, it's always a celebration of those three days and as a compendium in one great celebration, the Eucharist, Holy Mass. But how do we come to this understanding? Because of the actions and the words that happen throughout those three days. Listen to the words of Jesus at the Last Supper when he says, Take this, all of you, and eat it, for this is my body, which will be given unto you. This is the chalice of my blood, the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many. Do this in remembrance of me. Those words are very clear in the Greek, in the Latin, in the Aramaic. It doesn't matter. They're very clear. When I first became a pastor, when, I'm, when you're an assistant priest, and of course Father can back me on this, when you're assistant priest, you kind of have to, you know, the pastor is the pastor, and what, what he says goes. And you've, got to, you know, you've got to be obedient. When you're pastor, though, the onus is on you to make sure that things are, doing, are done right, yeah? and that teaching is right. We had two schools in my parish. It was a big parish where I was pastor in Melbourne. And as soon as I arrived, I went to go visit the classrooms. It was the beginning of the school year, and so the grade threes were, of course, getting ready for reconciliation and First Holy Communion. And I looked at the textbook. It was nice and pretty pictures. It wasn't the textbook of the Archdiocese of Melbourne, so already the radar was going off a little bit. And I went to go and have a look at what was being taught about the Eucharist. Okay, La La Holy Thursday, Last Supper, uh, table, uh, fellowship, um, you know, sitting together, Jesus, our friend. I said, um, sorry, where's, where's the rest of it? Oh, no, Father, this is the Eucharist. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm sorry. I said, from now on, I said, ah, get rid of that book. We use the text of the Archdiocese of Melbourne. We cannot be teaching the children that the Eucharist that we celebrate is only Holy Thursday and the Last Supper. Because that simply reduces the Eucharist to a very special meal and nothing else. Jesus, our loving Savior, clearly states and chooses his words perfectly. This is my body which will be given up for you. This is the chalice of my blood which will be poured out for you. What was he referring to? The next five minutes when they're going to finally eat and drink? No! No! He's referring to the great sacrifice of the next day. Because from the cross, we receive his body. From the cross, his blood is shed for us and for our salvation. And the reason we can celebrate it is because of the glorious resurrection. But as Catholics... And this is, of course, a teaching of the Catholic churches in all of its rites, Western and Eastern, and of the Orthodox churches as well. The Eucharist is not simply a meal. It is part of the understanding of the Eucharist. When you go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it mentions this. But when we're teaching our children for First Holy Communion that the Eucharist is a meal, and we sit at table, and Jesus is amongst us as a friend... We've lost the plot. So much for 2,000 years of Catholic tradition and teaching. Those poor martyrs over the last 2,000 years who have given their life and their blood for the teachings of the Eucharist. What are they thinking? Hang on a second. I died for this, and now you're teaching these children? It's all about just Holy Thursday? No. Lex orandi, lex credendi. It's more to the Eucharist than just Holy Thursday. It's where the story begins. I don't know if any of you, I'm sure most of you have probably watched the movies, but if any of you have actually read Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings, it's actually a very important Christian slash Catholic novel. 
Lord of the Rings has three books. No coincidence. The Fellowship of the Ring, The Two Towers, and The Return of the King. Tolkien wrote that as a catechetical device for his son. He invented the beautiful Elvish language and all those other things as well. But Tolkien's actually describing the Paschal mystery. The fellowship of the ring is all about the fellowship table at the Last Supper. The darkness of the two towers is all about the darkness of Good Friday. And if I have to explain what the return of the king is, well, then we're in the wrong place. It's all about Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. He did it in a very remarkable way, but yet that's exactly what he was teaching his son through those stories. And yet here we are, celebrating it time and time again. So when it comes to believing in the Eucharist, that's what we believe. Jesus Christ gave his life for us so that we could have life. He gave his life for us so that we continue to have him amongst us. At the ascension, does he not say to us, I am with you even to the end of time? Because he is with us, not simply spiritually in the Eucharist, but really and truly in the Eucharist. And as I said this morning, uh, yesterday and this morning as well, it is mystery. Because how does a piece of bread become the body of Jesus? How does a cup of wine become his blood? And yet we just heard St. John's Gospel. The Jews are thinking, hang on, this guy is now calling us to be cannibals. And it's the same catchphrase that has been used against the Catholic Church over the last 2,000 years. You truly believe you're eating the body of Christ? You're a cannibal. But he shut them up for all the right reasons. And we would understand what we are experiencing as well. The great theologian, uh, the, great, the greatest theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, gave us a great teaching on the Eucharist, as did the Franciscan St. Bonaventure as well, but that's just another matter. But the great Dominican St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, gave us a great teaching on the Eucharist. And he gave us a very interesting term regarding the Eucharist. And it's very hard to get our head around it sometimes, but it's been taught since the 1200s when he gave us the Summa Theologica. The teaching hasn't changed. The Second Vatican Council, and please get this right, my dear people, the Second Vatican Council did not change any teachings of the doctrines of the Catholic Church. Nothing. It changed not one dot, not one t nothing, including the teaching on the Eucharist and on the church and on the priesthood. The Vatican Council changed none of the teachings. It committed us to update our way of communicating how we, of course, our teachings of the faith and our practice of the faith. That's all. But the great thing that St. Thomas Aquinas gave us was the teaching on transubstantiation. Man, I'd love to have that on the Scrabble board. Transubstantiation. What does that even mean? Well, trans means going through, sub means going under, stands, the stantis, the stantiation means staying within. At the moment, the priest who is standing there in the person of Christ, in the persona Christi, says the words that Jesus Christ, our loving Savior, said that piece of bread and that cup of wine become the body and blood of Christ, really and truly, not physically. This is a term that's going to be very careful. The church, the Catholic Church, has never, from the beginning of time, beginning of time, beginning of the church, taught of the physical change in transubstantiation. It's not. It's a real change and a true change, not a physical change. That's why when people throw the term cannibalism, it makes no sense at all. Because as St. Thomas Aquinas reminds us, the accidents remain. You think of the accident, well, I didn't have an accident. Accident is a philosophical term, meaning the stuff that makes it the stuff that it is. 
Gee, I couldn't get more simpler than that, I don't think. But the bread is always going to be bread. It's always going to taste like bread, look like bread, spoil like bread. But really and truly, it is the body of Christ. That's why it's so important that we consist- continually um, you know, uh, receive that Eucharist and that Father, of course, continually uh, renews that Eucharist in the tabernacle as well because it will spoil. It's bread. The accidents remain, but it is the body of Jesus. That cup of wine, which has now become the blood of Christ, is still 14% alcohol. Shock horror. Yeah, it's wine. The accidents remain, but the substance has changed. That's what St. Thomas Aquinas reminded us of. The difference between the accidents and the substance. The accidental nature and the substantial nature. The accidental nature, it's bread and wine. The substantial nature, it is the body and blood of Jesus. And that's what we believe in the Eucharist. And we see that, of course, in the great celebration of the Mass. So the Eucharist, as Pope Benedict reminded us, is the mystery to be believed. And we can see that. See that very clearly in our teaching teaching given to us by Jesus, to the apostles, the apostles, to the next generation of disciples, they gave to the next generation of disciples, and that's what we call the apostolic tradition. We're able to write and have a catechism of the Catholic Church because our loving Savior Jesus gave the teaching to the Twelve. The Twelve then handed it on to the next generation, etc., etc., so it's very beautiful during the liturgical year when we have certain saints like, ah, uh, let me think of one now, St. Polycarp, for example. You think, oh, St. Polycarp, you know, oh, well, I don't really have great devotion to St. Polycarp. I don't have a statue of St. Polycarp. I don't pray a novena to St. Polycarp. I probably have never even heard of St. Polycarp. Who's this St. Polycarp? Yet yeah, St. Polycarp is a disciple of St. John. John taught him and Irenaeus and the rest of them. They sat at the feet of the disciple John. You, you can't get more direct than that. And then they were able to then, when they got, uh, got older, have their disciples sit at their feet, and etc., etc. The line of teaching in the Catholic Church is unbroken. The celebration of the Holy Mass, yes, liturgically, ritually different, the celebration of the Holy Mass is unbroken from the very moment of the Last Supper. We see that, of course, again in the Holy Mass. So the Mass is, uh, big part, the Eucharist is also a mystery to be celebrated. There's no such thing as the Eucharist on its own. You cannot speak of the Eucharist simply something as a mystery to be believed, Pope Benedict reminds us in that beautiful letter from 2007. It's also a mystery to be celebrated because it's from the liturgical action of Holy Mass that we receive the Eucharist. What is it? What do we do at Holy Mass? A little catechism here on what the Mass is and the parts of the Mass. What do we have at Mass? We have the introductory rites. The begin, of course, the sign of the Trinity, the sign of the cross. The beautiful greeting that St. Paul gave us is the greeting that the priest gives to you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we reply, and with your spirit. Thank God for that new translation of the Mass that we were given back in 2011. And also with you. I mean, how boring is that? No, come on. You can hear that in Star Wars, you know? No. With your spirit. Because that's an important, essential part of our human nature. We are body, soul, spirit, and heart. And it's an important part of us. And with your spirit. And what happens next? We have a penitential rite. Why do we have a penitential rite? Father, I don't need a penitential rite. I get a confession. I've confessed my mortal sins. Ah, but we're not perfect. I drove to Mass this morning. I argued with the missus because something went wrong. The kids were screaming at the back, so I had to tell them off as well. I cut off someone around the corner. I even just come into Mass. Man, do we need a penitential rite. 
And that beautiful penitential rite washes away all venial sins. Every single one of them. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And then we plead to the Lord in the Kyrie. Not just, oh, Lord, have mercy, Christ. Have... No, we are pleading with, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's what the Kyrie is. We don't use all those words. We keep it very simple. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. But that's a prayer of pleading with the Lord. Lord, have mercy. It's an exclamation. And boy, have I celebrated so many masses in my life. I'm sure Father can say the same thing. When you get through that and you're like, really? Is that how you plead to the good Lord to have mercy on your soul? Yeah, carry our legs on. Yeah, okay, whatever. No, it's beautiful. Lord, have mercy on me. And we know what the response is from Jesus. Of course I have mercy on you. I died on the cross for you. I give you all of my love and mercy. And that's what we should say, that beautiful Kyrie, with such love and joy in our hearts. Because yes, we are pleading for mercy, but at the same time in faith we know we are receiving mercy at that great moment, as we do in the great sacrament of reconciliation. And then of course we have the great Gloria, the song of the angels. I have to say the first time I went, I've been twice now, but the first time I went to Bethlehem and I heard the Gloria sung, well, I cried. I'm an Italian boy, I cried the drop of a pin, but I mean, it was just so beautiful. I thought, wow, I can look in the sky right here, and this is exactly where the angels cried out, Gloria in excelsis Day." Wow, how wonderful. We are singing the hymn that the angels sang at the birth of Christ. And again, how do we sing that hymn? Glory to God in the highest. And no, no glory. It's beautiful. I'm sorry, again, Italian boy, everything is all very exaggerated, but it should be, because that's a beautiful part of our faith. We are reflecting, we are singing the hymn of the angels to the shepherds, the great hymn of glory, glory to him, to God, who doesn't need our glory. I was having this conversation on a social media page the other day. It was good. I use social media a lot for evangelization as best as I can. But a, a, a fellow said, Father, I just read that we cannot add anything to God's glory. And he was really perplexed about this. And I said, well, no, we cannot add anything to God's glory because God's glory is perfect. He doesn't need, and don't be shocked by this, but this is the teaching of the church from the beginning. He doesn't need our prayers. He doesn't need our glory. But he glorifies us in his glory. Which is why we pray. Which is why we sing. Which is why we glorify. Which is why we worship. He doesn't need it. We need it. And in doing so, grace and glory is given to us as well. That's why that hymn is so important. And that brings us, of course, then to the liturgy of the word. The liturgy of the Word, which is so very important. The liturgy of the Word always comes first. We are nourished with the Word of God to be nourished by the Eucharist. Because remember that everything that is said in the Holy Mass, the words of the priest at consecration, but in throughout the whole Mass as well, it all comes from the sacred scriptures. If you ever want a good book to read on the relationship between the Holy Mass and Sacred Scripture, I can only recommend one, and that is Scott Hahn's The, La the Lamb's Supper. I was going to say The Last Supper, the, the Lamb's Supper. Again, it is so easy to read. In fact, it's rather entertaining. Scott Hahn, in his writing, I'll leave it at that because it's being recorded, but in his writings, is very entertaining. You pick up the Lamb's Supper and you don't want to put it down. And he shows us in the Lamb's Supper how everything that is written in the book of Revelation regarding the great liturgy is what we are actually celebrating in those beautiful words throughout the Mass. 
everything. The liturgy of the Word is so very important because it is from the Word that we receive sacrament, not the other way around. The Old Testament and the New Testament. And they are both as important as each other. Remember, and again, I think it was St. Augustine, but correct me if I'm wrong, the new is hidden in the old, and the old is revealed in the new. Yeah? I'll say that again. The new is hidden in the old. The old is revealed in the new. That's why we always have an Old Testament reading, the Psalms from the Old Testament, and a New Testament reading from the Epistles. They go hand in hand. There was a great heresy in the early church. A priest, believe it or not, I know that's hard to believe that a priest would be a heretic, but the priest was Marcion, and he was trying to show that we don't need the Old Testament anymore because Jesus Christ, in his very person, is the New Testament, the New Covenant. Well, how wrong he is. Even in the readings for Trinity Sunday, we see the flavor of the Trinity coming through in the books of the Old Testament. It's so very important. That's why we have both in the Gospel reading and the homily. All important parts of the liturgy of the Word to take us to greater heights. And then the Creed. Again, beautiful expression of our faith. Bishops fought bishops for that creed. Poor Athanasius had to go in hiding for that creed. Great men and women fought very hard for that creed, and we take it for granted. That's why when we pray that creed on Sunday, I believe in one God. Believe what you read, believe what you say, say it with conviction. And if there is something in that creed that you do not understand, guess what? The Catechism of the Catholic Church is online. Sorry to all the booksellers out there, but you just go to the Vatican website. The whole Catechism is there online. I don't understand what this part of the creed means. I know. I'll Google it. Use Google for something good for a change. Google it. Go to the Catechism. There's something in the creed that you say, hang on, I've been saying this for X amount of years. And I just sort of say it wrote now. Oh, yeah, then, then, uh, yeah, God from God, light from light. What does that even mean? Oh, I'll, I'll go and look it up. Because the onus is on every individual to grow in the faith, which is why you're here tonight. And of course, we go into the beautiful liturgy of the Eucharist, the offering of the gifts. Gifts, because they are gifts, the bread and the wine. The beautiful preface which begins the Eucharistic prayer. We are told to lift up our hearts. Wow. Whenever, in any other place or time, would you hear an expression like, lift up your hearts. Sur sum corda, lift up your hearts. Just here. Because this is the only place worth lifting up your heart for, to God. And to what's going to happen in this most sacred action at the altar. Lift up your hearts. And we go into the beautiful Eucharistic prayer, the beautiful prayers in the Eucharistic prayer. We have the canon, where we read out all the beautiful saints. Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James. Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damien, and all the saints. Clever, aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> years of years of saying it. Beautiful. All these. And who are they, by the way? Have we ever sort of said, oh, you know, Father reads out all these, you know, John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia. Who are these people? Why, why does he put Mother Teresa in there? Or why does he put J Pope St. John Paul II in there? Why does he put, you know, uh, you know all the, the, the American martyrs in there? Why do we only get those guys? Because that's the Roman canon. And those were the martyrs on whose altars the very first masses were celebrated. 
The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that's why we comm- we've been commemorating those that one set of names for 2,000 years in the Roman canon. And that's why that first Eucharistic prayer is very beautiful. And nothing against the other ones. I use the other ones as well. But the first, of course, is the canon. It's the rule. The word canon, by the way, means rule. The word canon was, was from the Greek, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure I am. It meant the measuring stick, yeah? It's by which we measure things with, the canon. And that's why the first Eucharistic prayer is the canon. It's what everything else is measured against. And the saints are very important. They're there for a reason. Then we have the epiclesis. You see that because the bells are rung. By the way, we have actions in the Mass that are very, very important. There's a reason we stand. There's a reason we sit. There's a reason we kneel. There's a reason we beat our breast. All these liturgical actions put the body and soul in sync. It's the way God wanted it. We use the physical nature of ourselves. We see that particularly in the Holy Mass. We use our hands, our ears to hear, our eyes to see, our mouths to speak, our tongues to taste the Eucharist. All the senses come alive in the celebration of Holy Mass. So we hear those bells rung. And we think, oh, hang on, something's happening. Because we just don't ring the bells for, for no reason. And we see all of a sudden the Father's putting his hands over the gifts. The great Holy Spirit descends upon those gifts at that very moment, allowing the words that Father is about to say to have that transforming nature that they need. It's beautiful. Everything has a reason. And he says the words of consecration, as I already mentioned, and he elevates. Why does he elevate? To show us? Yes. That's one part of it. You know, when Father's celebrating Mass at Orienta, which is a beautiful way of celebrating Mass, by the way, at Orienta means facing the altar, he elevates the host high enough for everyone to see. It's a moment of exposition, like we'll have on the altar here, by the way. When we have exposition on the altar, the monstrance is the hands of the priest. You realize that. That moment from Mass is transported out of Mass and put here on the altar. That's what exposition is with benediction. The monstrance is the priest holding up the Eucharist for us to adore at that moment. That is a moment of adoration. The chalice as well. But then something beautiful happens. He elevates a third time. At the peripsum, through him, with him, and in him, etc. But this time, the priest is not holding up the chalice and the host to show us. He's doing something else. He's offering the body of Christ to God the Father, which is exactly what happened from the cross. And this is where the priesthood comes in. This is why the priesthood is what the priesthood is, and we can't muck around with the priesthood. Well, I don't know if we have that expression here in the United States. In Australia, we say muck around means play with or abuse, yeah? Sometimes I get these Australian expressions out, and people look at me and go, what did he just say? We can't play with this moment, or with this aspect of the priesthood. The priesthood is a male priesthood because it is conformed to the maleness and the malehood of Jesus. The priest is truly conformed. He's a, another Christ. And we see that at that very moment, at the through him, with him, in him. He elevates the host and the chalice, Because he is offering the Son to the Father, the great sacrifice of Calvary. On the cross, Jesus Christ, the loving Savior, became the eternal high priest. What's the definition of the priesthood? It doesn't matter if we go 3,000 years ago to pagan times. It doesn't matter if we speak now. It's one definition of the priesthood that matters the most. The priesthood is the person set aside from the community to offer up the sacrifices on behalf of the community. That's what the priest has always been. Not a social worker or a counselor or anything else. Those things come with the priesthood, but not essence of the priesthood. The essence of the priesthood is exactly what Jesus Christ showed us at the Last Supper. Jesus Christ at the Last Supper 
was the victim, in other words, the offering, the host, but at the same time, he is the priest offering the host, which is why we call him priest and victim. He's the eternal high priest because he offers up the sacrifice of himself at Calvary. Again, the centrality of the cross. The priest at the altar is doing the very same thing. He is reflecting in a very real way the priesthood of Jesus because at that moment, at the, through him, with him, in him, he is offering to God the Father, the Son who has been sacrificed for us. Once on Calvary, but commemorated in a very real way at every single celebration of the Eucharist. We're not sacrificing Jesus at every Mass. He died once and for all on Good Friday. But what we celebrate is real. It is commemoration. To not be flippant about it, it's like this. At every single celebration of the Mass, we are transported back in time to that original Holy Thursday, we are sitting there with Jesus and the disciples. We are transported back to Calvary. We have the privilege of standing at the foot of the cross with Mary and the blessed disciple John. At the celebration of Holy Mass, we are transported back to the early hours of Sunday morning and we are running to the empty tomb with Mary Magdalene and Peter and John. That's exactly what we're doing. And at that moment from the cross, excuse me, sorry, very rude of me, I should put that water in the glass, but I didn't think. At that very moment at that Mass, the Eucharist, of course, the priest is offering up Jesus to the Father. That's the culmination right there. That's why we have the, that's why the Amen is called the Great Amen. When you open up your liturgy books, it says, oh, the Great Amen. Why is it a Great Amen? I mean, isn't every Amen a pretty fantastic Amen? And the Amen means, I, I truly believe. That's called the Great Amen because at that moment, God the Son is offered up to God the Father. We kind of forget that. Sometimes we sort of glimpse right over it. But yet that's the most but the single most important moment of the Holy Mass, that his body and blood is offered up to God the Father. That's exactly what we believe in the celebration of Holy Mass. Then, of course, comes communion, and the great preparation for communion. And I think my most favourite line in the whole celebration of the Mass comes from my most favourite saint, St. John the Baptist. You can't beat St. John the Baptist, really. I mean, seriously, he's the best. Who else was chosen to be the precursor to Christ? Who else was chosen to prepare the way of the Lord? John the Baptist. And how important is he? He is so important that at every single celebration of Holy Mass, we echo his words. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. When John the Baptist first said those words, that was a great moment of infusion of the Holy Spirit into his heart and soul, because those words are words of great wisdom. In a few simple words, behold the Lamb of God. And you know the scene, you know, it says that Jesus was passing by and John turned to his disciples, his own disciples, and pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God. John the Baptist could have said anything at, those, at that moment. He could have said, like, guys, maybe he was Australian, who knows? Hey, guys, you know, there's my cousin, my kinsman. He's pretty important, follow him. He could have said, that's the Christ, the Messiah. You may want to follow him now because I've done my bit and he's going to do great things. No, he just says, behold the Lamb of God. Why? Because in those simple words, John the Baptist summarizes the whole history of salvation, which is why it's my favorite line of the whole Mass. Because he equates Jesus with the Lamb that was sacrificed at Exodus, which freed the, uh, the, uh, the, the people of God from the Egyptian slavery. 
Jesus now is the true Lamb of God. And he predicts his great sacrifice was just as the Lamb was slain to free the Jews, the new Lamb of God will be slain to free all of us from slavery to sin. Which is why that scene at the cross where the lance pierces the side of Christ and blood and water pour forth is so very important for us. The sacramental life of the church pouring into our hearts. So just before we receive communion, we say those words, Behold the Lamb of God. This ain't just a piece of bread you're coming up to grab. This is Jesus, the Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself as the priest of God for us and for our salvation. And then we say the beautiful words of the Roman centurion. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But I only say the word, my soul shall be healed. Two very important lines from sacred scripture just before we receive Holy Communion. To remind us, this isn't just a private act. This isn't some right I have. It's my right to receive Holy Communion. This is some great moment, the greatest moment in my life every single time I come. And I reflect the words of John the Baptist and I reflect the words of that Roman centurion, a pagan, but who loved his family and his slaves so much, he would come to Jesus and say, Domine non sum dignus, Lord, I am not worthy. And we say the same. And we come to receive communion, communion with Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity, so that we can be nourished and complete that Trinitarian nature that is ours, as I said in my homily made in the image and likeness of God, infused with the Holy Spirit, and now nourished by Jesus himself. And of course, we have the final prayer, the blessing, and then we are sent forth. It was beautiful. I won't say it's a beautiful. Uh, there was a hymn back in the 1970s. Go now, you are sent forth. And I know it off by heart because I went to a Catholic primary school run by, as I was saying to Father Maltese, Franciscan sisters, and so from, uh, our school system in Australia is very different from here. We go to primary school, which is K to 6, so that's 7 years. And then you go to high school, which is 7 to 12. And anyway, from my K to 6 years, which are those 7 years, we had mass every Friday. Every single Friday we had school mass. And every single Friday for 7 years we sang, Go now, you are sent forth. But, you know, thinking back on it now, I'm like, you know what? Good. Because it's exactly what we're meant to be doing when we leave the church after Mass, do we leave as people who have just encountered the invisible God? When we leave the church after Mass, do we leave as people who are completely transformed in a Trinitarian sense, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? When we leave the church, do we truly believe that I have received the body, blood, soul, and divinity of my loving Saviour who died on the cross for me? When I leave this church, do I truly believe that I'm actually now very similar to the Blessed Mother, full of grace? I have to ask this question because I had a very busy, sort of almost inner, not inner city, but very big suburban parish in Australia. I was in a very big commercial area. And I'd see, I'd be greeting people after Mass and they'll try to get their car out of the parking lot, or as we call it, the car park. And I think to myself, oh my God, seriously? You've just come out of Mass. Where's the grace? The grace that you're meant to be taking home with you. Mums and dads, that grace that you're meant to be communicating to your children. Children, the grace that you should be communicating back to mum and dad. And yet, it's almost gone like that. Not because of him, but because of us. Lex orandi, lex credendi. Do we truly believe what we celebrate. So in this talk, I have tried, hopefully, hopefully successfully, to show us that when we talk about the Eucharist, we talk about the Mass, we talk about the priesthood, it's one topic. It's interesting how in our Catholic life, three and one go hand in hand, don't they? Even in Pope Benedict's um, expression of the Eucharist, a mystery to be celebrated, a believed, a mystery to be celebrated, a mystery to be lived. Three, but one mystery. 
The Eucharist is Eucharist, Mass, and priesthood, three in one. The Trinity, three in one. It's no coincidence. I've already explained that last bit, a mystery to be lived. That's not a trendy term. It's a fact of our faith. The Father says, go forth, the Mass is ended. We're meant to be taking it out with us in our lives. Are our lives transformed by the Eucharist, the most holy Eucharist? Are we able to use that grace to grow throughout the week and then come back the next Sunday thinking to ourselves, wow, I really need to be here today, as opposed to, uh, here I am again. Do we come to church on Sunday, not begrudgingly, not because it's a mortal sin not to come to Mass on Sunday, by the way, the Second Vatican Council didn't change that either, but we come because Jesus loves me. He died on the cross for me. He, he wants me to go to heaven. God created me to go to heaven, as we'll talk about on Wednesday evening. I've got to do my bit. Remember that beautiful scene from Ascension Sunday, it was just a couple of weeks ago. We read, as Jesus was lifted up, the angels had to come. The angels came and said, Men of Galilee, stop looking up in the sky. Jesus, who has been taken away from you, will come again. I always like to paraphrase the angels a little bit. And the angels are basically saying this, Oi, as we say back in Australia, Oi, Roll up your sleeves and go and do the work that Jesus told you to do. There's no looking up in the sky now. There's work to be done. Salvation of souls. And that's not just for priests and religious. The salvation of souls begins at home. That's been the teaching of the church forever. But Pope St. John Paul II reminded us about that time and time again throughout his great papacy. The domestic church. The place of grace place to grow, and the place to truly be Eucharistic. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.